Abigail Tucker, author of most recently Mom Genes, the Science of the Maternal Instinct. Um, so Abby, uh, my college roommate who pretty much never wanted kids, um, as far as I knew, decided to take the plunge last year and just had her first baby a few days ago. It was a grueling ordeal, but now she's um, over the moon and in love with this whole new person. So can you tell us in a nutshell, what has just happened to her? <laughs> You know, that, that is something that 10 years after the birth of my first child, I'm still trying to unpack, I think. Um, and the good news is that so are lots of um, interesting laboratories around the world where they study this uh, maternal transformation. Um, but basically, um, in a nutshell, um, there is a cascade of um, chemicals, some of which are related to uh, childbirth, pregnancy, and lactation that uh, change the shape and the, um, the wiring, basically, of the, the brain. And um, it gives rise to this really interesting shift in motive uh, that you can see crystallized if you study animals like sheep, um, rats, or monkeys, but also you can see in your roommate, probably. Um, and so she's at this moment, as any new mother is in her life, where... Um, She's more attached than ever to um, this other person, but at the same time, um, as you lay it on your book, in many ways she becomes more isolated um, from everybody else. Uh, so tell us about that and, and what should we be doing about it? Yeah. Yes, um, so there is some argument that um, new mothers are kind of designed to be in this insulated state where they're in this two-person universe and um, the scientists call it the dyad, the, the mother-baby dyad where you're kind of bonding, you're focused on uh, nursing and just learning the basics of child care. Um, and there's even this really interesting dampening of stress systems that you can observe in the lab where um, late pregnant women and um, new mothers are sort of resistant to stresses that would bug the rest of us. Um, that said, um, isolation, if it's sort of taken to an extreme, can become really um, poisonous, as a lot of us have seen during the pandemic. And so it's sort of a fine balance between be giving new mothers the space and time that they need to become and get made, and that's kind of what was the the gist of my book discussing kind of the forces that shape us, and then also not leaving them um, high and dry, basically, to fend for themselves. Yeah, one thing that you point out in your book is there's kind of a catch-22 um, with the pandemic where um, it just became more apparent than ever um, how vulnerable mothers are uh, pretty much at every stage in their motherhood. Um, but that in itself, if it causes the birth rate to drop and there are fewer children being born, um, society may become rather than responding to that positively, even more hostile because the fewer there are than the less understanding um, there and infrastructure there is for them. Um, so Ross, uh, <laughs> what do we do about that? You want me to talk about policy? There was, there was a promise that there would be no policy. I, for, I just want to thank, um, thank the Bruderhof for having us and, and all of you for being here. Um, I'm told this is the second hottest ticket after Budapest in all of, all of uh, religious conservatism. So you're either here or there, um, and, and, we're, and we're very happy to be here. Sorry, I just had to get that joke out before we, before we went any further. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think, so, basically the pandemic took, right, it took, a, you know, trend that sort of dates back a very long time, but had sort of accelerated over the last 10 or 15 years, the collapse of Western and U.S. birth rates, and accelerated it further. Um, and, you know, I mean, our, I think, the experience, we had a, a baby, um, in fact, um, and by we, I mean, mostly Abby, um, <laughs> was, who was born literally two months into the pandemic on 
April 20th, which was actually the peak of deaths in New Haven. Um, and we had had COVID ourselves, excitingly, uh, about a month before that. Um, and so I think we had a pretty good sense of why one would not necessarily seek to get pregnant in that, in that uh, 2020 window. Um, I think the good news is that there has, first, there has actually been a tiny rebound in the birth rate in the last six months, um, and it is possibly connected to some of the push for family-friendly policy that was supposed to be the basis for an exciting new American conservatism and instead is the basis for the Biden administration's, um, the Biden administration's domestic agenda, which is just sort of how things, how things work. That's cool. Not, not bitter about that at all. Um, the Rubio presidency that could have been would have been awesome, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, there, there's this, this question that people in my profession wrestle with a lot, right, which is just, you know, how much does public policy affect any kind of cultural trend, but especially a cultural trend where that is such a complex and intimate thing involving intense transformations, the scale of which I didn't even begin to understand before Abby handed me her book to, you know, help her with the footnoting. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I think as far as we can tell, the basic answer is that very pro-child public policy can sort of move the needle from, let's say you have a country that where the birth rate is 1.6 and the goal is to have a birth rate of at least two, right? Really, a serious investment in pronatalist policy gets you maybe to 1.75 or something from there. I think that's, that's sort of the, the smart pronatalist sense. But it's sort of operating on the margin in a system that is still determined by much more complex forces. Which means, I, I mean, I think it is those kind of policies are 100% worth pursuing. You, you just have to recognize that they're working at the margin and that you're also trying to basically, theoretically lay a foundation for a different society that might emerge once, you know, our grandchildren are in charge of things rather than, rather than our, our decadent, if you will, generation. So about every six to 12 months or so, a new demography report or a book comes out um, that revives this discourse. And uh, everybody reports to their battle stations um, with social security or environmentalism or, or feminism or, or what have you, or why are we even, you know, isn't it kind of creepy to be worrying about how many children women choose to have? And to me, the, a key fact that like really always gets left out of that is that people report wanting to have about one more child um, than they actually are managing to do. Um, so you wrote this piece for Clow, The Case for One More Child. How can we help these people have that extra child that they say they want to have? What do you think? I mean, it's such a personal decision. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, Abby has been recently trying, you've been trying to encourage some friends of ours from school to have one more child. So I think, can you, can you speak to what, what, have you, what have you been telling them? Um, I'm not sure. I think they have started to avoid me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, um, I don't know. I guess um, I, I have a lot of different uh, mixed feelings about this. I guess um, I was of the view that back in the olden times, people really did have lots and lots and lots of children. Um, but um, actually, and that may have been true, but um, the environment that um, we created for those people meant that most mothers didn't um, die with that many surviving children. And that was a very sort of sobering perspective for me. And I guess sort of, um, what I, you know, came to understand through my research on the maternal transformation is that as powerful as this 
um, sort of personal renaissance that happens in women is, um, women are super dependent on the environment that we create for them and it's kind of like an if you build it they will come scenario, like you have to create the right infrastructure and um, social networks and um, stuff like that for um, people to uh, go on with this. So I do think that just having, we send our kids to a school where it's rare to have, we have four kids, which I know isn't that many for this particular group, but in the school that we attend is sort of a freakish amount. And I do think that our, <laughs> our presence there helps sort of normalize this idea that it's um, you know something that can exist in that particular world, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I, I think I said in the piece for Plow was that this is this this school is a quite it's quite a progressive and secular school and it's you know th there's sort of a an imagined I think scenario where you have your fourth child um, in that kind of environment and people start to like raise their eyebrows at you um, now of course the school doesn't it's a private school they're very excited you know <laughs> ch ch right um, but but I haven't noticed, I, I mean, I, yeah, I've been struck by, like, in all seriousness, this, you know, this couple who are sort of, essentially, it's sort of an internal argument in their marriage about whether, whether to have a third kid. But I, I think there is clearly a sense in which the example of having people around you who have more children, you know, to people who already have children is helpful in imagining having more. I don't know. I don't know. How did you decide that you wanted, that we were going to have four children? Because the thing, the thing is, people have this idea, right, that like I'm, you know, I'm the well-known Catholic intellectual who married a nice, a nice girl from a good congregationalist family and I must have like, you know, brutally, you know, I, anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but, in, but, in, but in fact, as Abby confesses in her, in her book, by the time we got to child two and child three, I mean, I would say you, not that I was against it, but you were more pro-natalist in our own context than, than I was. Um, so I'm curious about, about how that happened. That's, that's right, you're reminding me that I should have our, uh, our drinking water tested for toxins that you may have put in there to, <laughs> to change. But, um, I, uh, yeah, I guess um, one experiment that kind of, uh, you know, as we talked about a minute ago, I'm really interested in this idea of a shift in motive, and I can see that in my own life, whereas, um, you know, somebody in my 20s, I was sort of um, very eager to defer, not, not do away with, but kind of permanently punt the idea of having uh, a child until I was sort of as old as uh, seemed uh, wise uh, by the medical guidelines and you know for various reasons we ended up having a child um, a little bit earlier than that and um, I guess I found it to be so <laughs> So, so rewarding that I, um, you know, I, I think of it as a kind of addiction that I just sort of wanted to have more children. And, you know, I use that word um, jokingly, but um, it's actually like if you look at these um, experiments in rats that show what happens to the maternal mind um, as, uh, you know, a, a rat, a female rat, they call them virgin rats, the ones who haven't had babies yet, transform into these maternal beings. Um, a virgin rat has her priorities like really, really straight. Kind of the only thing that she wants out of life is food. She basically will, you know, go to any length to get any kind of food and she especially likes these kind of sticky, sweet kind of foods that a lot of kids like, like Charleston chews and Fruit Loops and things like that. And so you can kind of like set her up with a bowl of Fruit Loops and she's going to be happy. But um, just about um, a day before this rat um, has her first litter, there's this um, sort of 180 that happens in her brain and suddenly she starts choosing pups over food. And in fact, um, there's this classic experiment where um, you can um, offer a new mother rat a bar to press to have um, babies delivered by um, a chute into her cage. And, um, 
And, and uh, these, uh, these mother rats were just absolutely relentless in hitting this bar again and again. Um, they'll, um, you know, until they were basically buried in babies. And actually, you know, speaking of drugs, there are other experiments that show that um, mother rats will choose uh, babies over cocaine. Um, and um, so it it's really is a, uh, a, a change in what you find to be rewarding. It's sort of um, a matter of oxytocin and dopamine, things that I still don't totally understand, but um, it's very real. And yeah, I'd say by, and it's also cumulative. So I do feel like there's almost like a snowballing effect. Like if you have three kids, maybe you want four. If you have six kids, maybe you want eight. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we've actually never done an event on stage together, so you guys are witness to a very strange experiment. Um, but you can, yeah, you can, you can interject. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so one rat, um, I think, takes this uh, case for one more child uh, more to heart than anybody else possibly who's ever lived. She um, provides herself with. 684 baby rats, um, and science never found out how many she really wanted because the researchers just gave up and the cut research, off the yeah, The researcher <laughs> gave up. They got too tired to keep going. But, uh, um, so you write about how every time you have another child, you actually become a, a different mom because of it. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Actually, can I mention one thing before we Please. go to that? I did, um, you know, I know precious little about public policy, but I did want to talk a little bit about that um, idea of, you know, the birth rate. And I think that from my research, one thing that kind of stands out is that it's not actually just about the number of kids born. There's kind of interesting research that shows how public policy decisions can relate to things, and like economic trends can relate to things like lower birth rates and miscarriages, and even things like how many boys and girls are born, born in a population. And I kind of found all of that to be fascinating. Um, so what was our new question again? Sorry, you I just, that just a has different been flooding up. Every time. The boy and girl thing? Yeah, um, there is uh, pretty well established research that shows that in the wake of really stressful events, and I'm not sure if this has been borne out in the pandemic yet, but uh, most famously, I think, by 9-11 and terrorist attacks in France and things like that, um, an interval of whatever it is, six to ten months after those events, there's an uptick of, n of the number of girls born in um, a population. Um, there's also studies uh, recently from Columbia that show that women who are um, the most stressed out are more likely to have girls. And the evolutionary logic behind this is that um, there is, boys are more taxing to gestate and are actually sort of the better evolutionary play in a situation where environmental conditions are good and they could go out and have like a Genghis Khan style uh, amount of uh, grandchildren, whereas girls are always going to, whether times are lean or, um, or, or better, are going to have um, a steady number of children. So that's a kind of interesting theory, but um, the idea of how stress and um, uh, can play out in the maternal body is something that's very interesting to me. There's also um, some cool scientists out in California who study how things like um, uh, financial downturns um, and uh, reductions in employment levels can uh, relate to numbers of SIDS deaths, sudden infant death syndrome deaths. Um, so I think all of those subtleties are just as interesting as just like the flat number of how many kids get born. It's like how many kids were on the way to being born. Uh, mis miscarriages are another interesting area of study. But so anyways, that's, does that satisfy? Okay. <laughs> I just thought the okay. and, and the boys write that it's after like your team wins the Super Bowl. Yeah. Nine months after that, people are more likely to have boys. That's the flip, right? Yeah, or the World Cup victory, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's, that is slightly. Um, that research is a little bit less well established, but there have been these studies <laughs> that show that after events of quote unquote national, I think the most famous one is that there's an uptick in the number of male births um, 
something to do with the end of World War II. Um, but um, these events of national jubilation seem to yield um, high numbers of boys. And this isn't to say that anyone who's pregnant here or becomes pregnant is going to fall prey to any of these trends. It's just that if you look at um, population-wide events, it's just these marginal but interesting differences. Yeah, there's always such an enormous split between things that are happening at the the, you know, the bird's eye level and then the individual circumstances and um, decisions that people make. Um, so I would love to hear how, you know, for an individual, you become a different mom every time you have another child. Exactly. Um, I think a lot of that, too, has to do with the actual child that you are gestating or adopting or whatever the case may be. Um, I talked with these really cool researchers at Johns Hopkins University who study the way that fetuses, um, which have what could be called fetal temperament. They have um, various levels of activity, and of course there's the boy-girl factor that people are interested in too, um, to showing how um, through all of those seemingly kind of pointless somersaults and flips that the baby does inside the mother, how there may be sort of a conditioning that occurs to prepare the mother for the particular baby that's being born. And um, they study this through all kinds of hilarious ways, but one thing that they do is um, they uh, put basically like gel masks and um, noise canceling earmuffs on these pregnant women and then they sneak up with them on them with this tube full of unpopped uh, popcorn kernels and they rattle it really, really loudly. And then they measure, it, since the fetus is the only one who can hear that sound, they measure what the fetus's startle reaction does to the mother's body. And they actually have really profound effects on the mother's body and they, there's a great deal of variance, like not all fetuses respond the same way. There's also fascinating research on like, you know, we were talking about how having boys is a little bit more taxing. Um, there's uh, some research that shows that women who have um, a boy are, you know, more likely to get postpartum depression. There's also research that is showing that having many boys can lead to um, early maternal death, which was a little <laughs> depressing, um, but also kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, the, the factors that go, the ingredients that go into making a mother are so, this was the thing that I, as much as I was interested in that light switch of, you know, change in motive, on to off, non-mom to mom, I became interested in the forces that kind of modulate that transformation and make each mom who she is. And they go, you know, everything from did you have a C-section? Did you babysit when you were a kid? Who was your mother and how did she treat you? What are the contents of your um, bank account? You know, do you like your job? Um, what is your lifelong exposure to plastics? All of these variables that scientists are sort of slowly beginning to unpack to sort of understand um, how each one of us gets made as an individual mom. So if you are the biological mother, you basically can't help but have all of this happen to you and, and go through the transformation. But um, fathers can opt in uh, to, and as well as adoptive parents um, to a lot of these transformations by, um, by their acts of caretaking. So uh, Ross, why don't you tell us about opting in? I mean, as, you know, some of this is sort of obvious. I mean, I, I, will, I will say that, like, when we had our first child, um, it, if you read Abby's book, it was, you know, not the easiest delivery. And there was definitely a way in which, I think you can see this in, in, in data, but there was definitely a way in which, in my experience, like, you could feel Abby's focus shift, right, in this this sort of, yeah, profound, intense, like, 24 hours from not being a mother to being a mother. And I could, f you know, my, my shift was different. It was like, you know, I was still, there was this zone of, like, Abby's primary focus had shifted to Gwendolyn. We were not allowed, they told us we were not allowed to say their names, but, you know, they, they're, they're far away. They're at least, like, 20 yards away. Um, Abby, Abby's focus was, like, shifted to Gwendolyn. And my focus was still more like, okay, I have 
Abby, who I love, and she's the person that I'm married to and primarily care about, and there's this other person there now who's cute, you know, it's, you know, it's good, like, it, she's my daughter, but it's, you, you could sort of feel the transformation towards, like, whatever you think of as sort of the paternal instinct happen more gradually over 24 hours, over weeks, um, and so on. And I think that's completely borne out in most sort of mom-dad research, right? Where, like, you know, the motherhood is, for a biological mother, a total, an unchosen experience, whereas a man who gets a woman pregnant and doesn't stick around, you know, will be a father in sort of legal terms and formal biological terms, but whatever the paternal equivalent of the maternal transformation only happens if the man is there. Um, and, you know, the extent of that transformation, um, I mean, you can talk about this. I, I, I will say, you know, there's sort of, listening to you give interviews about the book, right, there's sort of two ways of doing the emphasis, right? For, for certain audiences, you're more likely to say, well, look, there's, you know, of course there's this sort of seed within all of us, male and female, that can be sort of coaxed and nurtured into sort of full, you know, full parental care, right? Um, that's if you're stressing the, if you're talking to an audience that's more, shall we say, egalitarian. Um, but if you're talking to an audience that's more complementarian, then you're more likely to say, but, but look, the change is way bigger. <laughs> for the woman than the man, right? And both of those things are true, right? Like, there are studies of gay dads in San Francisco, right, where the gay dads who are parenting together have more, right, more similarities in their brain changes to mothers than, right, right, um, than do just a father with a mother. It, maybe it was in Israel, it was in Israel, sorry. Um, so there is, right, there is some sort of plasticity in, the paternal instinct that's real and can be sort of turned in more maternal directions. Um, but at the same time, like the scientists that you talk to are always like, but, you know, the change in the woman is just much more profound. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, there, one interesting uh, study that got a lot of play a couple of years ago was this study where they watched the brains of women from before pregnancy through pregnancy and delivery to two years after, and they saw these changes in brain volume. They were actually losses in brain volume. That's not as bad as it sounds. It actually, they have a whole explanation for why this could be like a strengthening and a neural pruning. But anyways, they... <laughs> They developed a, an algorithm that basically could diagnose mom brains from looking at these scans. And, um, you know, one of the finer points of the study was that they had looked at dad brains. They hadn't been able to find these same strong trends. That's not to say that the trends aren't there. And there are these measurable differences and stuff like um, changes in testosterone in new fathers. It drops. Um, and um, there's changes in... Um, you know, and scientists are studying, like, what is the mechanism that catalyzes these changes and can make men into mom-like beings? You know, paternal is just kind of male, male maternal. Um, and, um, you know, it may have to do with, like, you know, people have, you know, said, does, oh, well, does the smell of pregnant women change the way that men view baby pictures and all these interesting things? The, the jury is still out. But, you know, having introduced this idea that, you know, dads are, you know, slightly different than, than moms and maybe there's a wider spectrum of behaviors from total non-involvement to very mom-like behaviors. I will say that, you know, I think a lot of us know people who are adoptive parents who are, who are just kind of excellent parents. And I went to a lab um, at New York University where they um, basically, they made moms in two different ways. And it just kind of blew me away that there's labs in the world where people can just make moms like, you know, using test tubes, it's, they can. Um, in one of them, um, they had, they took these virgin female rats and they, um, they were able to release oxytocin inside of their brains and, you know, study how this introduction of this neurochemical related to childbirth and um, lactation 
change the way that these rats, individual neurons, um, responded to the sound of rat pup cries, which was a pretty interesting thing to see over three hours, a way that kind of showed in very stark terms how a chemical associated with the biology of motherhood changed um, the female brain um, of these virgin, these virgin female rats. However, in another corner of the lab, they were making mothers in a very different way. They had um, these cages of little rat pups uh, who had their biological mothers with them, and they would um, take a virgin rat and put her in with the pups. And for a while, um, actually, I think these were mice. It's a big deal to the to the rat people, if it's a rat or a mouse, don't ask me about all the differences. But um, a mouse into the into this cage with all these babies, and normally, you know, the the virgin female will flee from these babies or even attack them. But if you leave her in there for about a week, her behavior starts to change, and through these mysterious reasons, she starts performing maternal behaviors and fluffing up nests and retrieving babies instead of biting them and all of this good stuff. And if you're to dissect her brain later, you can see that there's changes in her brain that mirror what would be happening in biological mothers. So it's in real, in real life, out in rat land, in these wild rat colonies that you could study, that doesn't happen. You know, mice and rats don't generally hang out with unrelated babies. But when humans make the choice to do that, I think there's a very strong argument that our brains do change to support that relationship, even if you haven't gone through pregnancy, childbirth, and lactation. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, so how does that um, initial transformation change over time? I. Uh, and the skills that you need as a brand new um, mother or parent of a very young child are almost the opposite ones of the what you need when they're, you know, they they're 18 and uh, need to leave you. Um, and so, <laughs> once this transformation has happened to somebody, um, how does what does the science say about how um, that changes over time, or how we can help those parents stay good parents through all the many different kinds of parents that they're going to have to be. Yeah, that's one of the really interesting things about human mothers. There's so little commonality in terms of what we do. If you look at cultures across the world, there's places where, you know, even if with infants of the same age where people don't use mother ease, in some places you don't really talk to your kid at all for the first two years and you can just sort of put it into this backpack down your back and forget he's there, which is so different than what we see on playgrounds around here. Um, but yeah, the, I think that there's, um, a lot of different, you know, ways of doing things, and we are not born with any kind of script or instinct. In fact, the only thing that I could kind of find in the research that human moms across the world do is this weird tendency to carry children on the left side. Um, and that's called left side cradling bias, and it's something that Ross and I had actually talked about in the past. He's a right cradler, I'm a left cradler, and we've had these elaborate arguments about, you know, why is this? And um, I won. <laughs> well, no, I didn't really win, but basically, you know, scientists have, scientists have looked um, at other kinds of female mammals who have young, and even animals like walruses and fruit bats and any kind of mammal you can look at have a tendency to keep babies on the left, and that has to do with like the kind of the lopsided layout of the brain and the, pro the way that our hemispheres prefer to process social cues. But that's left, left sided cradling bias doesn't get you that far in life. Like so much of motherhood is just like learning and I think, you know, we are designed to just kind of learn as we go. And we also have this unique predicament of humans as we have sort of like these, we have basically litters, but they're litters that are kind of linear litters. We don't have one crop of kids and then they go away. We have kids that we're kind of like nurturing for years and years. In most animals, it, one of the really interesting things is that, you know, the maternal relationship is so intense. There's this flip switch and this uh, change of motive. But then, once the mother becomes pregnant again, she just ditches that former baby. She just kicks him right to the curb, you know. There's 
fascinating videos of mother bears like racing away from their poor yearling cubs, you know, because they basically found a new boyfriend. Um, so it's, um, it's, we are tasked with a lot. This sort of juggling of multi-age children is a pretty uniquely human thing and good luck <laughs> with that. I mean, and humans are one of the only, we're one of the only species that has grandparents, right? Like this is, so that, that mother bear running away, in part, it's like, you know, it's, there's no sort of grandparental role in the animal kingdom outside of, is it which? Yeah. which well, Yes, there was a, a, there's, so whales are definitely in, not all of them, but the, the small toothed whales, um, like, uh, like orcas, they have, they've got good grandmas. And then there's kind of debate about um, elephants, uh, you know, they got some grandmas going on. And there's, but basically like long lived, highly intelligent um, mammals, a few, there's like maybe three or four kinds. Right. So that, but that in turn like creates entire, I mean, obviously we all, live with it, sort of social structures that, um, that ideally, I mean, our kids are, our kids are really too, like we, we, you know, I don't know what it's like to have an 18 year old, right? But ideally sort of sustain, sustain the social structure as the kids, as the kids get older and create basically multi-generational dynamics in theory, depending on your relationship to your parents. The day I took my oldest, uh, who's now five and a half, home from the hospital, I cried thinking about the day that he was going to graduate from high school and go on to college. <laughs> my husband thought I was out of my mind, which I was. Um, but uh, even after you reach that stage where your, your children are completely independent and you don't need to care for them, except, you know, maybe in a, a distant, like, a, you know, a very boundary um, on their side, <laughs> laid in emotional and perhaps financial support, but you're not doing all the, any of the same things that you used to do. But you are still changed. You literally still have their cells running around inside you. You have this example in the book of a, um, a mom whose son didn't even uh, make it to be born, but his cells that remain inside her had like regenerated a whole new liver for her. Um, so what else can you tell us about how, you know, what, what the permanent changes? Yes, that's that um, fetal microchimerism research, which is su super interesting about how the baby's cells kind of trespass across the placenta and become part of the mother's body. And a lot of them kind of get flushed out after um, birth, but some of them linger in low levels for, um, for life. Um, and this, this is an interesting example about a baby that was never born um, that um, was found to have reconstructed a large part of his mom's uh, liver when her parent, when she was being, um, you know, examined, she had some kind of severe liver disease and they looked and they discovered that a large lobe of her liver was made of Y chromosomes and um, they were able to piece together that this, these cells came from a, a baby who had not ever been delivered, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and there's labs now that are studying, you know, ways that this research could have implications for fields like cardiology where there's, um, hard to regenerate uh, tissues that may be inside mothers uh, more naturally protected. Uh, there's a phenomenon where mothers and um, late term pregnant women have higher than usual recovery rates from heart failure and there's this idea that it could be these um, multipotent fetal cells that sort of sense inflammation in these areas and go into your body um, and, I mean, are in your body and, and start sort of um, rebuilding there. But there's a whole lot of research that we still don't understand. Scientists are trying to understand the impact of maternity and the number of kids you have on um, your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease, for example. The jury is very much out there, out still there, but um, 
Basically, women, I'm pretty sure, are more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Nobody understands why, and they're trying to sort of piece together, you know, how many children, you know, is it protective, is it not protective? Um, so there's lifelong implications in, in those terms. But I think most um, important for our daily lives is that this maternal circuitry that gets kind of um, built in when we go through uh, maternity for the first time doesn't appear to ever go away. That study that we were talking about where the brain changes over pregnancy and they took pictures before and after pics from the old you to the you two years after giving birth for the first time, the brain's volume never changed back to its old form. Um, and that's not because, um, you know, they thought, well, two years is a good stopping point for the study. They, the implication is that these changes last for a really, really long time. And so if you become a grandma, there's an argument that grandmothers and older women who've had children before are sort of the ideal caregivers. And that's be not just because they, you know, have changed a diaper or two in their day. It's because they have these sensitivities that have been, you know, turned on through their own life histories, and those are ready with just a little bit of sort of dusting off to, to go back to, you know, being, basically being moms, I think. Or so we tell our mothers when we, when we throw our children at them and run away very quickly. You're still a parent. I mean, one, one thing that struck, struck me, so when Abby, you know, when, we talked about the idea for the book originally, I sort of had the idea that, you know, the maternal instinct that it was going to be about, like, why do some women become mothers and, why, you know, why others don't? And, you know, what is the sort of maternal instinct that's, like, built into, you know, your personality or your brain chemistry long before you start having kids? Um, and for me, one of the, I mean, you know, one of the takeaways when I actually read the book at the end was that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem that that's actually incredible. Like, the, the transformation that happens when you actually have children is so much more important than any sort of pre-existing propensity towards, you know, liking babies or not liking babies or wanting to have kids and not wanting to have kids, um, which was really interesting. It also made me think, you know, in this sort of, like, what is the future of the human race question, um, you could actually sort of weave a more pessimistic argument out of that, right? That like a society, a society that passes a certain point of sort of denormalizing having kids, there isn't some like magical, you know, place in the female brain that's just gonna, you know, bring back the birth rate automatically or, or anything like that, right? That like, a culture is, you know, if, if mothers are sort of transformed human beings, a culture with a lot of mothers is going to be shaped in one way, and a culture without a lot of mothers is going to be shaped in another way, and you can probably have sort of, I don't know, it seems like you could potentially go along those paths for a while um, without some sort of, you know, Darwinian, Darwinian I must have kids now impulse kicking in and sort of turning things over. On the other hand, the flip side of that is that like you could argue that a society where fewer people have kids you get sort of selection for you know like something right <laughs> that sort of the people who do have kids the weirdos who have you know who have who have larger numbers of kids are obviously sort of the parents of the future of the human race and that has its own sort of shaping impact um, anyway yeah, well, so, Rasa, in, in your book, um, I think you're essentially making the argument that our, um, we've sort of lost confidence in ourselves and in the future, and we're sort of perfectly happy to be where we are. Um, to have a child is to cast a vote of confidence in the future, and if um, there's a lot of people out there who are worried about um, climate change or who just can't make ends meet, um, and all of these anxieties and pressures that are very real. Of course, the disaster of uh, COVID brought this home um, in a very stark way. But as you also point out, people have had, have cast that vote of confidence in the future under like really just other like unimaginable conditions. Um, so what's going on there? What do they know that we don't? <laughs> 
I, I don't know. I mean, I, I go back and forth on how much of the declining birth rate to attribute to that kind of lack of confidence in the future. Like, clearly that lack of confidence in the future does exist, right? Um, that's, you know, and it's sort of a mix, a mix of, you know, comfort with how things are and pessimism about how, wh where they might go. But, like, when I look at, like, people in our cohort who have and haven't had kids, the divide, I, I, I'm curious what you think, but the divide seems to be much more about, like, you know, sort of their their pathway through life and their relationships than it does about, like, sort of necessarily their worldview, per se. And, I mean, their worldview affects their path through life, right? So more religious people are more likely to end up in situations where they, you know, get married and have kids, right? Like, that's, that's clearly true. Um, but the people, like, in my group of college roommates, for instance, um, the people who haven't had kids are not not having kids because of a lack of confidence in the future or because they're worried about global warming. It's that, you know, they've, their, their relationships with the opposite sex haven't worked out or they've chosen a weird career path where they're trying to run a startup in Silicon Valley and at age 41 and they don't have time to date. Or like, I don't know, it, it seems, so that makes me th think that maybe it's more I don't know, that like there's the sort of breakdown in relations between the sexes is maybe more important to understanding this, this trend than sort of big picture ideas about what the 21st and 22nd century is gonna bring. I, I don't know. I mean, like when our, when our more secular friends get married, they still have kids, right? I mean, it's not like I don't know, we, I, I don't feel like we know a lot of like, you know, dual income, super successful secular people who are like, and we're not having kids because we're liberals, right? Like, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, it feels like there is a finely calibrated generational divide. Um, I know that m myself and my close girlfriends, we kind of followed the, you know, the standard, you know, college educated track and had first babies around 30. My sister, who's more of a technical millennial, she's like two, 18 months, only 18 months younger than I am, but has this totally different relationship with technology. I feel that her, her friends have a completely different relationship with having children. And I can't help but think that there's some sort of link to that. And the, the women that your friends are dating also tend to be from that more kind of millennial generation now, <laughs> I'd have to say. Um, not, not <laughs> That's right, he's dating up. But the other thing that you know strikes me, just talking about these, these pub public policy ideas, is just like the importance of um, having, you know, I think female politicians who have children, I think that's a really important thing. And um, uh, in my research, I, this isn't something that I wrote a lot about, but I kind of stumbled on the story of Australia where they actually have really good um, maternal support programs. They have things like, um, you know, these baby hospitals where any mom who feels like she needs help after the, you know, 48 hours that you're allowed to have in the hospital with your baby, if you need help, you can go and check yourself back in. There are nurses who will help you teach your baby to sleep. In New Zealand, it's a similar thing where they have this really hardcore system of nurses called the Plunkets that keep track of new moms for years and years. And I can't help think, but think that that's because th these are places that had really weird um, gender ratios starting out that, you know, there were lots and lots of men in these places and women were a little bit more of a scarce commodity and they had, you know, maybe an outsized say for that reason. So I, and also the president of New Zealand is, uh, or the prime minister is a uh, famously a, a new mother. So I, I think that that's something that can't be underestimated. And I do think that if you look globally, there's not that many really um, powerful mom politicians and that that would be something that could engender some real changes. This is, so, so there's an op-ed the, 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 that I have tried to convince, no, actually I, ha I haven't convinced Abby to publish it, that, that would like 
be one of these break the internet op-eds where, like, you know, I don't want Kamala Harris to be the first female president because she's not a mom, right? Right? Wouldn't that, I mean, that would, like, break, wouldn't that break the internet? I think that would break the internet. I'm, not that Abby would ever write this op-ed, I'm just saying, like, hypothetically. Abby, Abby right. I guess I, I, I legitimately don't understand why that's something, like, I just haven't seen that discussed that much. I don't think she shouldn't be, I don't think she shouldn't be the, the vice president. I think she's fabulous, but I just, I don't understand why that point of identity politics doesn't matter. Presumably, one major reason why female politicians or mothers are underrepresented is because they're, you know, they have they lose all this time, there's all this sacrifice and bio biological nitty gritty. I just don't get why, you know, we can't s say like, it's un, un, you know, if that's not the handicap, then what was the handicap basically? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> from what I hear, uh, Kamala Harris is a very loving stepmom, which brings me back to my point about opting in. That's right. Um, Abby, like everything that you describe, the scientific processes are essentially a, um, involuntary. You know, they just go of their own accord. Um, Ross, at the end of your article, you make the case for parenting as kenosis, a kind of chosen selflessness uh, where you force yourself into the situation where your own needs are um, secondary if they're met at all. Um, what, what, what can you say about parenting as kenosis? I mean, I, yeah, the, I think what I said in the piece was just that while, you know, there are obviously ways in which parenting can become an occasion for, like, horrible selfishness, and, you know, everyone has known families where, you know, it seems like the parents are living vicariously in some awful way through their kids and so on. Um, and so I don't, you know, I, I don't want to overstate the case, but when I look at my own life and think about like, you know, the things in my life that have sort of made me less self-centered and less likely to be focused on my selfish needs and desires, they sort of, um, well, when we, had, when we had our first kid, a colleague of mine who's sitting in the front row over there wrote us an email, it was one line that said, welcome to unavoidable reality. Um, and which we've quoted to other, other new, many times ever, ever since. And that, yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a sense in which, like, there are ways in which all of human life is unavoidable reality, right? That's sort of put there for us to, um, you know, sort of ideally be transformed by in positive ways. But definitely, especially in the world in which we live, that is sort of buffered from suffering and struggle in various ways that we're very privileged to enjoy, the unavoidable reality of children that does seem like something that sort of pushes you in a way that you wouldn't otherwise be, be pushed and empties you ideally to some extent of certain kinds of, certain kinds of self-centeredness that you otherwise wouldn't be emptied of. I don't know. I mean, do you think, you wanted to ask, is parenting, is, is having kids selfish or unselfish, right? Oh, I think it's, a, it's a really, really good question, because you get like, you know, you also get this sort of, well, a Ann Coulter wrote a column uh, this week where she attacked, I think, J.D. Vance, uh, Mitt Romney, me, and a few other people for advocating for pro-family policy and she said something like you know these people have been made so miserable by parenting and are so addled by it that they want to inflict you know they want to make sure to inflict it on as many poor fools as possible um and, th and that was an amusing column but of course like what is actually the case is that you know you yeah you you you, you develop in addition or sort of in conflict with this kenosis you also develop a certain pride, right? A sense of like, yeah, that's right, we had four kids, you know, what have you done lately, right? And like, that's, and that 
some of that helps carry you through the long nights <laughs> and, and the long, long car trips, but some of it is very spiritually un, unhealthy, probably. I, I don't know. What are you, I'm going to... Yeah, I think that there's, you can argue that it's sort of, you know, this, this total change in motive that, that happens in various ways that we can study. It's almost like an, an it's not exactly selfless or selfish, it's like an unselfing. Like I think you could argue that you're, you change enough that you are someone else. And so you are kind of, you know, doing the Darwinian thing and pushing for your genes and your legacy and stuff like that, but it's also sort of not the old you anymore. So I don't know, I think it's probably both, not sure. There's a really striking image um, in an essay that came out a couple years ago by Brad East. He talked about watching his wife's um, C-section and they, they strap your arms out like in a cruciform shape um, in order to have that surgery and, and slice you open. And so he was reflecting on the, you know, the parallels and that, you know, you're really hopefully, I mean, most people survive that, but you're really in a very real sense laying down your life um, and taking on all that suffering um, for the sake of someone else. And, you know, that's an extreme example, but then you are doing that in some manner every day um, for your kids, and it, and it really does force you into that um, kind of selflessness. And uh, I certainly, when I, kids were born, I, you know, you have the sense that, like, every baby is your baby. You become very emotionally raw. You can't watch, you know, sad things, you know, or hear sad stories. But... The fact is you're not doing for every baby what you're doing for your baby. Um, and as time goes on, uh, you know, the temptations are there to, like, you know, purchase advantages for your own kids that, you know, separate them from other kids in very real ways. And, and people can end up focusing only on the, you know, becoming very selfish, you know, not just in the sense of themselves as an individual, but in terms of their own family unit. So how do you make the leap from... Um, becoming a selfless person and caring for your own children to making the world a better place for other children? That's, it's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, when, when scientists are studying this, they use these different animal models. And one of them is, you know, rats. We talked about the shoot. And to a rat, just because of their particular biology and where and how they live, every baby is their own baby. They don't know which baby is theirs. You can give them, you know, a baby from a rat across the world, and they'll say, oh, sweetheart. They just don't differentiate between them. But sheep are a different story because of the way that they live in a big herd with lots of other sheep, and they have this precious resource of milk. They're not like a rat living in an isolated burrow. They have to know which baby is theirs. And so for them, it's the complete opposite. And it's that within you know a few hours of birth, they have memorized their babies sent down to the molecule, and they basically despise all the other babies except for that one. And humans are somewhere in the middle. We are, um, a human mother is sensitized to generic babies and baby photos. You can look at our you know brains go light up in sort of interesting patterns and in whatever lab scan you want to look at. But there's also this attachment to the one particular baby. And while we're not like the, the, the sheep wanting to, you know, trample any baby who might get in our way of, of our own uh, darling, there are studies in human maternity wards that show within something like 20 to 4 to 48 hours in a multi-bed, multi-mom maternity ward, moms have learned to wake only for the sound of their own baby amid all of that chaos. And so I think that we all have the potential to, um, you know, to love any baby as our own, but I think it does take effort because we do have this sort of special, um, almost like romantic attachment to our particular babies. Um, so it's something to be overcome, but we also have it in us to, to do it, I think. Well, I mean, you know, this is also where probably my own, my essay about kenosis had the naivete of like, the guy whose kids are young enough that you haven't yet had any of them apply to college, right? And so there probably is a way in which there's something Maybe, maybe not. We can come back and talk about it in 10 years or something, but there's maybe a greater unselfishness or self-emptying involved in having the four-year-old than there is in trying to shepherd your children into the meritocracy or not, as, you know, as, as the case may be. Um, 
So, I, yeah, I feel like, yeah, it's probably the case that sort of as the child detaches from you, the temptations of sort of treating your family as this sort of privileged unit unto itself probably increase. There's probably some, some relationship between that. Um, that there's a book by a guy named Matt Feeney called Little Platoons that uh, I've only read part of, but Feeney's a really smart guy, and I think it's sort of concerned with some of these issues um, that I would, again, without having read every word of it, I would recommend. All right, well, um, with that, I'd love to open it up to a few questions. Should I? Um, yeah, Leah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a fact. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that, you know, all this stuff isn't scarier than I ever thought. It's quite disturbing to think of your, um, your old self getting uh, tossed in a certain way. And um, although I will say there are really interesting uh, studies, you know, on, on people who use uh, substances and drugs, and they actually have a different relationship with, with baby pictures. <laughs> Um, yeah, because it's like some of the same dopamine systems involved and um, people do see actually, you know, that's kind of one of the, the modulations of modernity on how, you know, potential mothers are. Like there are ways that if you, if there are other kind of powerful drugs in your life, they can actually mess with your perception of infants. But um, I generally just think that it's best um, to kind of uh, just go in with an, an, an open mind to what might happen. And I think one of the comforting things to me is that it's every person is different and there's no way to say that like, you know, oh, you have to give up your old job to be a good mom. Actually, if your old job makes you feel good and you, you know, like your coworkers and it makes you feel like you're doing something important and um, you, uh, you know, you like the money then the financial security that it brings, then you should keep on doing that job. You know, that there's no way to say it's time to drop everything and retire the, all the old trappings of you. But I think you have to sort of be a little bit nimble in thinking, you know, how am I going to usher my new self into this world and to give yourself the space and time that anticipates that. One of the interesting, um, more policy-oriented ideas that one of these, um, study uh, scientists at the Yale Child Study Center mentioned was that she thinks that you know not only do we need these epically long maternity leaves but we need maternity leaves that start before birth because um, then you know you have like you know six weeks or a month to you know get ready for that you know the, the most profound change, which is internal, as scary as all the labor and delivery ward stuff is, the brain is sort of the key organ of childbirth in the end of the day. And if we kind of acknowledge this change of self, we can also kind of tend to that organ of our bodies as it transitions to. I don't know if that sounds <laughs> any, any warmer and fuzzier, but I think it's dangerous to ignore, I would say. Don and Jay.
What's the, the Dutch, the crumbs? Oh, we, can't even, we can't even say it? Well, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. Um, it's Kravortsmerger or something like that. It's the, it's the, the, um, the Dutch uh, baby nurse, basically, who is publicly funded and who, uh, you know, after the moms leave the hospital, they're not just like dumped on the street and told, you know, oh, we gave you at least two free bottles of formula. You know, you should be fine. This is a, you know, qualified uh, baby nurse who goes home with the moms and helps them out for two weeks and kind of helps them get their, their footing. And I, I actually do think that changes in hospital settings are sort of um, one of the keys to, to, to changing things. Like we kind of think, you know, oh, a hospital is a hospital. It's a place where people help you. But like the difference in um, C-section rates, for example, across hospitals in poor versus rich neighborhoods, it's something like 10% to 70% in some of the poorest corners of America. And C-sections, I've had four, so I've, I've been there, I've been on that, that slab before. Um, they're not the, you know, the ideal way, I'd say, to, to deliver a child if you don't have to do it. And I think that, you know, oftentimes the women who, who are having these operations are already ones who are carrying other burdens, may have, you know, stresses, lack, lack of certain support systems, and they're the ones who should be flagged for sort of extra services. And even something like getting, um, you know, the Yale Child Study Center did a study on what um, single variable most commonly correlated with postpartum depression in new mothers, and it was actually lack of access to disposable diapers. So that's another thing that's just sort of like an easy fix, you know, we should just give, you know, if we're better in hospitals at identifying who needs help, you know, we have these resources. It's so much easier to stave off these conditions up front if we can than wait for them to kind of unravel disastrously. And there's huge differences around the world in terms of like postpartum depression is more common in certain cultures than others. And scientists think that things like income inequality are really bad for um, uh, postpartum depression, like being in a place where you might not actually be poor in a global sense, but you feel poor. So there are things that, you know, the, the maternal biology is very kind of sensitive to the environment. And if we um, use hospitals to even make simple interventions, like making sure women have comfortable pillows to sleeping on, everything from that to making sure they have diapers, to making sure there's someone who's going to check in on them for weeks and months and even years afterwards is just like totally uh, beyond price, I think. I agree. <laughs> well, we're out of time, so I would encourage everyone to grab some coffee and continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Ross and Abby, for joining us. Um, <laughs>